If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? So let us ask. Let us pray. Lord, grant unto us your Holy Spirit, that we as your church might come unto your word and from your word discover your understanding, that it may be engraved by your Spirit's hand upon our hearts, that we might be a sign of your Spirit before the world as tongues of flame, as a gusting wind was a sign of your presence to those long ago, that we might, like Peter, speak your truth and in your truth together rejoice. In Christ we pray, amen. Ask for anything. Anything. Ask for absolutely anything. Jack, if you were to ask for anything, what would you want right now? Candy? Candy? Yeah. Ah. He's not asking. Okay. If you were to ask for anything right now, what would you want? Jamie. Jamie? What do you want? What do you want? What? You want an apple? They're in the fruit basket. You can have one after church. Okay? See? He's going to get his apple. Anyone else? <laughs> Seek for anything. We sell ourselves short in our faith when we come to these times in our lives when, oh, I don't have it. I really want it. In fact, I think I probably need it. And then we go, oh well. That's not the invitation we have in Christ. It's not, this isn't about asking God for the things you want. Uh, Lord, give me a, a boat and a car and, an, and a couple of houses and an apartment building to run and, and a small industry and you know a full bank account. And I mean, you can ask for those things and and... God willing will provide. God willing will hopefully also keep you from those things which would distract you from faith, from life in him. But what Jesus is saying here most of all is open your hearts, your minds, your very soul to the possibilities. Open yourself to the possibilities. That is the Spirit of God asking in Christ. Christ is inviting us to open our hearts in the humility of prayer to make our requests known to God. To say to God, I admit, I recognize, I know you can help me. What do you want? What do you absolutely need that the gifts of God will sustain you. How much more do you need than what God has already given? Ask. What are you going through in life? What are you trying to find, trying to complete that isn't already fulfilled? If you are searching for the wrong thing in life, you need to trust that God will deliver you to the right thing and encourage our stubborn spirits to embrace and celebrate what is right, what is good, what is the kingdom of God. But what that is, what the kingdom of God truly is, can be hard for some to discern, especially with the cacophony of choices and voices that are out there, when the voices are many and charismatic and convincing that each way is right in its own way, we seem called upon to judge between good and evil, rather than seek for good and follow God in order to leave the evil behind us. And there's a difference in that. We want to choose what is right. We want to give and receive from our perfect God. God's love in its fullness. The fellowship, the exchange of fellowship and friendship and familyship and, and the kinship of being God's people. To share and embrace the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
And that is hard sometimes among us. It's hard even in our own families at times. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, in chapter 12, he explains to them that the Holy Spirit has many gifts. Paul would write a similar letter to the, to the church in Galatia, chapter 5. He explains to them that the Holy Spirit has many gifts and there's many administrations of those gifts. So even among God's people having similar abilities, similar gifts, we use those gifts in different ways. Which way is the right way to use those gifts? Which gift is really a gift? Can a gift be a gift for one person and a challenge for another? In the last few weeks, we journeyed through the, books of, the book of Revelation. But one passage we did not cover. It was pointed out by more than just a few people. Chapters 2 and 3. The critique analysis of the church. With some grace, it is imparted on each of these churches. This critique These churches in what is today Turkey are meant to be exemplary churches and not always our best example. And John reveals that it is not he that is making the critique, not him, but Jesus standing in judgment over the life and ministry of those churches, speaking through the angels, the messengers to each of those churches. Revelation is, and the revelation to those churches is, and maybe the revelation to us is, or maybe we won't be surprised with this, there's room for improvement. I wonder if John and Christ through John was reminding the churches that as well as you are walking with Christ, as well as you are obeying the commands in the gospel and living the new life that is in Christ, let there be room for improvement. I wonder how many of those criticisms would come as a surprise to those churches. How many were exactly what everybody was always saying about them anyway. I don't believe that Jesus is writing a stereotype, stereotype about these proclamations and revelations, but he's stating an identity in its relation to the living gospel among those churches and how they manifest the Holy Spirit among them and how they live out Christ's commands and the authenticity of their faith. Today we are not here to see which one of those churches we're most like or find out whether we are like one that you want us to be like but to look at what it means to be a church under the judgment of Christ and also under his grace at the same time. Do you appreciate the contention that we always face, this judgment and grace, the Holy Spirit's presence that causes us to humbly discern where we stand? God's presence and the counselor Jesus promised that calls to the very core of our soul with such irresistible grace to come and to be in fellowship with other people just as broken and as sinful as you are and just as self-righteous as you never admit to being and just as good and gracious and forgiving as everyone knows you to be and you do not let yourself feel and celebrate as you should. How much... It is the presence of Christ in you. The disciples, they'd watched Jesus ascend up and out of sight, not all that differently than we might have imagined Elijah rising on his chariot of fire, except Jesus needed no ride to get where he was going. He was gone from their sight, but not gone from their presence. And when they were all assembled and the timing was right, Christ's promise of the help that they would need to be the church came as a bright breeze settling on the disciples gathered together and their flames rose upon them tongues of fire or maybe in today's terms a light bulb I have seen in you when in my speaking or in the choir's anthem or especially as the word of God is read before you 
as the Spirit speaks to you. I have seen the flush on your cheeks, the change in your posture, the attention in your eyes, and we can glimpse in those moments when the resonance of our understanding is so obviously joined and palatable, driving among us, we feel those flames arise. Not the lashing of fiery whips of some devil's hell, but the refining fire of our own understanding and the joy of knowing with a deep confidence that goes beyond so much understanding, knowing that it is not I who speaks, but Christ who lives in me, who speaks. That God is really present with us and we are experiencing the continual forgiveness of soul deep sin until we are indeed and in being made a new creation in Christ. We can't just skip over the account and the preamble of our reading today from the book of Acts. Luke recalls for us that they were all with one accord in one place. What do you think you're doing now? with one accord in one place. I have spoken before that this will not be, the, and this will not be the last time that I speak about the falseness that is a Christianity without fellowship. It's a false idea. We cannot be Christians in the Holy Spirit independently. I want to take you to some of the moments of this week from this year's General Assembly. Not, a, not inappropriately themed, receive the Holy Spirit. This year, a pathway of inclusion is embarked upon by the church. And there are many who feared this decision. They were polarized by who've left the denomination simply because this was being asked. I want to tell you what happened. As I have been hearing reports, and these aren't the handwritten reports, but calls I've been taking through the week, messages I've been receiving about people and their experience of assembly this year. And something I feel ashamed that I was surprised by. But I was humbled when I heard it. I want to share this with you to assure you that while the decisions are being discussed in the courts of the church, people who fundamentally disagreed with each other found themselves praying with each other. And I mean going off to, to rooms or quiet places around the campus where the assembly was taking place, sitting in gardens at benches, bowed together in prayer, vehemently opposed on this issue but worshiping God and praying together. Side by side, always seeking for ways to be resolved with one another, able to receive and gather at the Lord's table together. Not disregarding the differences, not despite the difference, differences, but in the midst of there being no unity in their fundamental theology willing to be in one place and of one accord, waiting for the Holy Spirit to guide them. That is the denomination you belong to. That is who we are. That is fundamentally who the Presbyterian Church in Canada, there are other Presbyterian churches out there, but the Presbyterian Church in Canada is fundamentally different in this way. It's the way that Christ lives in us. And in all the world as I have not seen it anywhere else than in our denomination. We don't always agree. Have you noticed that? In fact, I would like to say that we are a Christian church that disagrees together. When all the other denominations split or stick or call it quits, something different happened. Here, happened at assembly. We said we are going to love one another, that an issue that seems sometimes more worldly than, than really speaking from the gospel and our gospel need. But there seems to be no issue 
given the power to break up the fellowship that God has made here. So the decision to be inclusive turns out to be more about including, including in our fellowship people who disagree with us, who don't necessarily get along with us all the time, who speak differently about Christ, who have not just a different but opposing views about the Bible and its interpretations. And then I thought, is that any different than what we've been doing? Is that any different than when the, the Parthians and the, and, and the Medes and the Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and, the, and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and in Egypt and Libya and Syria and Rome and Jews and proselytes and Cretans and, uh, and Arabians all heard from God together and they, as they were gathered together in order that they might know and experience the presence of God in Christ? I think it's good when we agree. It's great when we get along. But you know, I've never been a part of any congregation of any church or known any denomination, not any branch of the Holy Catholic Church in Christ to always agree. Most of the time, we cannot agree to disagree. And what this experience is teaching us is to let the disagreements stand. Let them be there. Let the arguing continue. The discussion go on. But let nothing get in the way of us being brothers and sisters in Christ. If we deny, if we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, well, that's the sermon on Luke chapter 12. But until then, let's be like any real family. Like the families we come from. We have our disagreements. Disagreements. 